Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I am uh, Kostadinos Karanassos. Uh, I am with Microsoft. Today I will be talking to you uh, about how we enabled uh, rich placement constraints for long-running applications in YARN. Uh, I will be doing the presentation, then Arun will take over and he will give a demo about how we can, uh, in real applications, uh, use these uh, placement constraints that we used. And uh, this is a joint work with uh, Panagiotis Garofalakis, who is here also in the audience, and Peter Piechuk from Imperial College London, and also with uh, Siram Rao. Uh, so going back a bit uh, to, uh, just to give you the perspective of uh, where we are, uh, to the Microsoft Analytics stack, you saw that in uh, Siram's uh, keynote yesterday. Uh, so I want you to focus on the uh, left uh, bottom uh, part of the uh, of the screen where we have the project we have done in Microsoft for uh, uh, resource management in YARN. Uh, so there are three projects, Mercury, Federation, and Region, that you most probably are familiar with that are already in YARN. And uh, the two new ones is Media, that I will talk to you today about, and uh, Morpheus, uh, that's uh, with uh, Carlo and Subaru today at 410, I think. So you should go and listen to that as well. Uh, so start, let's see, first of all, what are these long-running applications? So these are uh, LRAs for short. These are applications that uh, constitute of uh, uh, long-running containers. And this is uh, to be differentiated from the typical traditional uh, YARN applications like MapReduce that are based on tasks. So these applications can run for um, minutes to hours to months, even more. And um, uh, as we can see, there is an increasing demand for such applications. So first of all, we have, for example, uh, interactive data-intensive uh, applications that use long-running containers such as Spark, LLAP, Impala, uh, that use that in order to um, reduce the cost of spinning up new containers. So then we have streaming systems like Storm, Samza, et cetera, latency-sensitive applications like HBase, Zookeeper, MemGasD, and machine learning uh, frameworks. Uh, there are now a lot of problems related uh, to long-running applications. Uh, here I give the most important of them. So we have the deployment, discovery of LRAs, the upgrade, the container migration. These first problems are, um, uh, there is the focus of uh, the Jira I give here, from, which is driven mostly from Hortonworks for adding native support for services in Yarn. What we are focusing on today is the scheduling of LRAs. And uh, you can follow the JIRA, which is actively, we are actively working on. This is the uh, 6492. So just some background. We started uh, last summer with uh, another JIRA, and then we joined efforts uh, with uh, 4902 from Hortonworks. Wang Dahu is here, has been working a lot on this. So uh, we have discussed a lot. This is kind of a, a cross-company collaboration, and we have converged in this JIRA, uh, 6492. Um, now, why do we care at Microsoft about L uh, for LRAs? So here I give you in this figure the percentage of machines that are used for long-running applications across six, for our, uh, six of our uh, typical clusters. Uh, each of these clusters comprises up to 50,000 uh, nodes. And uh, we are currently, as we said yesterday, transition and today actually, uh, transitioning uh, to YARN. And uh, what I want you to see from this figure is that first, uh, all, across all of these clusters, at least 10% of the machines are used for long-running applications, and we have actually two big clusters that are dedicated to long-running applications. So it's quite important for us. And uh, given the current uh, implementation of the scheduler, given the, uh, the underlying system, we, uh, the best we can do is to statically pick the machines that are used for LRAs, or like use something like go to this specific machine, or, or even randomly. Right. And um, so just to, to get a bit more precise, uh, here is an LRA scenario which is derived from the Microsoft cluster. So here I show you just a toy cluster. Our cluster are actually a little bit bigger. Uh, so this has uh, eight nodes uh, split in uh, two racks and uh, across two different upgrade domains. Upgrade domains are node groups that are upgraded at the same time. Sorry for the color, it appears kind of different in the projector. Um, and I uh, think that you have uh, two different classes of applications. You have, for example, a key value store like HBase and uh, data is partitioned in memory across nodes. And then you have another class of applications, which is streaming applications such as Storm, for example. And uh, those applications are reading data from the key value store. Uh, so let's see what an application owner wants for, for when scheduling uh, this, uh, this type of applications. Uh, first of all, applications, uh, application owners care about performance. So we would uh, want to have uh, support for something like place all my you know, S1 instance containers within the same rack, or place all, my, uh, all the S1 containers in the same node or the same rack with a key value store where it is reading data from. Apart from performance, we also care about resilience. 
Uh, so with that, I mean, for example, you want to place your uh, KV and test containers across different fault and upgrade domains. So in case of failure, uh, you can recover faster. And uh, similarly, you can say place uh, no more than two S1 containers on the same rack. Just to show you a bit why we care, apart from performance for resilience, uh, here I'm plotting uh, in one of the typical Microsoft clusters the percentage of unavailable machines in the course of four days. As you can see, first of all, um, there are quite a lot of spikes in unavailability. It can go as high as close to 10%. Uh, usually it's around three or four. And these are not only failures, obviously, right? It's machines that are available for upgrades as well. And uh, what we have observed is that machines usually become unavailable in, uh, in groups of nodes. And uh, that means that if we do random placement during the scheduling, a job might lose many of its containers at the same time. And this is something, obviously, which is not desirable. Now, going back to the requirements, uh, to recap, what we want is expressive constraints. So we want to be able to have constraints both within the same or across different applications. And we also want uh, different constraints of the form affinity, anti-affinity, or cardinality that I will explain more. And uh, at the same time, we want high level constraints. So we care ab about being agnostic to the cluster organization. So we don't want the user to say, I want to go to rack one or rack two, because uh, uh, this is uh, like uh, based on the cluster organization that we don't want to reveal. And also, uh, we want to refer to both current and uh, future jobs. That's from the application side. Now let's see what the cluster operator cares about. We want, first of all, the, to support uh, global constraints. So a cluster operator might want to say something like, don't put more than two streaming containers on the same node, uh, because there is a lot of interference, etc." cetera. Uh, at the same time, we want to, do, to optimize globally the placement of such, uh, such containers. Uh, so for example, you can see here that we want to minimize the resource fragmentation. You can see node one, for example, we have very little resources left, which creates resource fragmentation. We also want to minimize what we call constraint fragmentation. So there, you see, we have the constraint not put, do not put more than two streaming containers on a node. So if a new streaming container comes in node two, we will not be able to place it. And lastly, we care about minimizing the load imbalance. So you see here, for example, in this instance, we have a lot of fully loaded uh, machines while others are not loaded. Uh, and at the same time, we do not want to affect the, la the latency of existing uh, uh, task-based uh, applications. There is some existing support for constraints in, uh, in the scheduler nowadays. For example, we have some simple constraints in Slider for uh, Yarn or in Marathon and Aurora for Mesos, but all these are kind of rudimentary and are based on static machine attributes. Uh, Kubernetes only lately added some uh, more involved constraints, but this is still listed as a beta feature. And uh, all applications, uh, the problem is, another problem is that all applications go through the same scheduler and there is no globally optimal placement decisions taking place. Mm, so now let's turn to the, uh, the design of our system. So uh, I'm showing you here the Yarn uh, Resource Manager. Uh, I want you to focus on the, uh, the, um, the red uh, components, which are the new ones that we have added, namely the LRA Interceptor and the Constraint Manager. So in what follows, I will first talk to you about how we are defining constraints in our long-running applications. Uh, then I will focus on how are we storing these constraints in the Constraint Manager. And then I will talk about how do we schedule uh, applications with constraints. So first about constraint uh, definitions. So we introduced the notion of container allocation tags. So this means that we are attaching tags to containers. So this is different from the existing uh, node labels that we have uh, in Yarn that are static, for example, of the form this machine has a GPU. Uh, and um, just to give you an example in this uh, toy cluster that we have, the possible tags for a KV1, for example, container can be that it is an age-based container, it is a key value store container, and it is memory critical. Uh, similarly, uh, and also you, you should notice here that uh, using the tag, for example, age-based, we can refer to any container that is uh, belonging to age-based, either current or future. And uh, going from the uh, allocation tags, we also define the tags for nodes and node groups. So a node inherits the tags of its running container at its given moment in time. So for example, in this instance, the, node, the tags of node one can be KV, HBase, Storm, uh, as well as the application IDs, et cetera. And uh, similarly for racks or other uh, node groups, uh, uh, we have, for example, for the, the tags of rack one, we have all the, the tags of the, of the containers that are running at the moment in rack one. 
a second notion that we're introducing in order to be able to express our constraints is the node groups. So node groups, think of it as uh, um, groups of nodes that are defined by the cluster operator. So by default, you have your nodes, you have your racks, but you can also define, for example, your fault domains, uh, or you can define your upgrade domains of the nodes that are getting upgraded at the same time, or even you can have like an in infinite bad island uh, that you want to specify. And um, those are, uh, those are updated by the cluster, uh, are added and updated by the cluster operators. And this is also important, as I mentioned before, about uh, for achieving encapsulation, because this way we don't expose the underlying cluster infrastructure to the users. Now that we have defined the allocation tags on the node groups, we turn to actually defining the constraints. So this can be defined in many different uh, levels. So for example, at the resource request level, we can say that all these containers belonging to this resource request, I want them to be uh, within, a, within a host, don't put more than one of them. So this is kind of a node anti-affinity. At the same time, uh, we can define constraints at the application level. So for example, we can say that each storm container should not be placed in a rack with more than two eight base region servers. So this is an affinity, uh, it should be placed with, sorry, with at least two eight base region servers. So this is an affinity constraint. And at the cluster operator level, we can have something uh, of the form, for my Spark containers, I want at least three, but at most four at every rack, uh, at most 10 in every rack. So this is a cardinality constraint. And as you can see, we can have both within an application, constraints across applications, and also, for example, Spark can refer by the operator to any current or future uh, job in the cluster. And uh, at the moment, we are defining constraint uh, through a, through a prog programmatically through a Java API, but uh, eventually we also want to create uh, um, a constraint language for that. And uh, what is nice about our approach is that all our constraints can be expressed as a conjunctive normal form of a single generic type, which is important for simplifying the, the design of the scheduler internally. Uh, and uh, there is a patch available for that. You can go check it out uh, uh, in 6593. Now, how do we store the constraint? As I said, we introduce a new, uh, uh, we introduce a constraint manager, and uh, this has various roles. First, we want to keep the active container tags uh, in the constraint manager, so this is per node or per node group. Uh, we also want to store the node groups, so there is a REST API for the cluster operator to add, remove, update the node groups. And most importantly, we want to store the constraints. So when an application gets submitted to the cluster, we store its constraints to the constraint manager. And also we have a REST API for the cluster operator constraints. And of course, what we, after storing them, we want to efficiently query them. We are looking into either efficient data structures or even an in-memory database for doing that. Uh, and this is the JIRA again uh, for looking into this. Um, after this, how do we do the actual scheduling? So we have two different approaches, the first one like here, as you see, uh, as I said, we, we talked about the constraint manager. Now I'm focusing on the LRA interceptor that does the actual scheduling. And uh, you should notice here that we have a two level scheduler design. So we have the LRA interceptor to be sitting outside the capacity for scheduler. And I will talk uh, uh, in a minute about why we, we follow this design. So first of all, what are our different algorithms for doing the placement? We have an uh, integer linear programming based uh, scheduling. So this is an online algorithm. Whenever an application with constraint comes, it directly schedules it. Uh, the placement constraints are added as part of the ILP and we have support for both hard and soft constraints. We have an objective function that is used for optimizing the placement to minimize the node imbalance and the fragmentation. And we also support replanning of the LRAs and, and we take into account minimizing the migration cost of the containers. Uh, this is the ILP based. We also have a heuristic based approach. So we have two different heuristics. We have the tag popularity, which means that in that one, we, uh, we prioritize containers first with tags that are appearing in multiple constraints. And the second one is the node candidates, which gives, uh, gives us also the best, uh, pretty good results among the two, uh, is the, the one that favors containers that can be placed in the least possible number of nodes. So these are the more restrictive uh, constraints. And uh, as I said before, we are following a two scheduler design. So we have the LRA interceptor for, for placing the LRAs, and then we use the existing capacity or fair scheduler uh, to do the task-based uh, applications, to schedule the task-based applications. We do that first because we do not want to affect at all the latency of existing jobs, uh, like MacReduce jobs. And um, 
And another important bit is that we have uh, only the task-based scheduler, like the capacity of the fare, to do the actual allocation. And this is done in order to avoid the conflict between the two schedulers. And of course, this will allow us to use either the fare or the capacity scheduler easily. And uh, this is a modular design which avoids also extensive changes in the capacity scheduler or the first scheduler. And this is important for us because we, are deploy we want to deploy this in production, so uh, it makes it much easier uh, for deployment. And um, let me tell you a bit about a couple of experimental, uh, experimental results. We have, uh, so first, um, what is the performance benefit uh, by using our constraints and especially anti-affinity constraints? For that, we use the 275 node cluster. Uh, we deployed multiple instances of HBase, uh, and we were using uh, YCSB, a, data, a load generator over a couple of terabytes. And we also had GridMix as a background map reduced jobs. And uh, here I'm plotting, uh, first of all, uh, the request latency in milliseconds for six different workloads. And on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, I'm plotting the throughput. So a couple of observations here. Uh, we can achieve, uh, using media and our constraints, up to 3.9x better latency on the 99th percentile when compared to, to yarn, and 53% uh, better, uh, better throughput. And uh, even if we enable uh, C groups, we still achieve 35% uh, 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 more. So it's good to use both, essentially. And C groups most often can be beneficial, but sometimes they are not. Uh, they don't bring uh, better improvement. And uh, I talked about affinity now, about uh, the benefit of anti-affinity constraints. So here we deployed the Storm, uh, Storm application with uh, Memcast T, and the Memcast T um, was, uh, the Storm was reading from uh, Memcast D as part of the, uh, uh, the application, and uh, what I'm plotting here is uh, the CDF of the, uh, the latency lookup for uh, MemcasD. As you can see, uh, we have 4.6 better uh, mean latency over YARN just by using uh, the intra-application constraints. And uh, the total mean latency is uh, 7.6 uh, times better over YARN and 5x over just using uh, uh, intra-application uh, affinity. And to wrap up and then uh, give the token uh, to, to Arun, uh, I presented you the scheduling of LRAs. Uh, I introduced the placement constraints, intra and inter application. We have different constraints, affinity, anti affinity, cardinality. They're both expressive and high level. And then we have uh, an LRA scheduling, uh, scheduling algorithms that uh, allow us to meet our placement constraints, optimally, optimize the quality of placement, and we follow a two scheduler design. And this is a JIRA again, so we are currently, we have a design document uploaded with, uh, with Wang as well. Um, it's currently work in progress. So with that, I give it to Arun to give you the demo. Hello? Yeah, hi guys, uh, I'm Arun. Uh, thanks, process. So I'm going to go first connect to my <laughs> Wi-Fi network. Hopefully the Wi-Fi gods will let me complete my demo. But yeah. So um, we've actually implemented media on top of uh, Hadoop 272. And I'll show a couple of deployments where we um, actually deploy an application using it. So just give me a sec. This warms up. So uh, I'm going to go start with, see if you guys can see this. OK. I'm just going to go stage a, oh, I made it smaller. Sorry. Uh, yarn cluster, a neat node, simple yarn cluster. And we'll start from there. So let's just see if things are working. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the distributed shell uh, application uh, for the rest of my demonstration. So initially, what I'll do is like we'll just deploy a simple distributed shell application with, uh, let's say, around uh, 32 workers. And we will not, you know, uh, exp uh, and we'll, we'll not specify any constraints. Essentially, what we'll say is that we'll let the scheduler place it randomly. So go see. The application is up. And 
as you can see, the 33 containers that are allocated. That is 32 plus one for the application master. And uh, it's generally, it's mostly a random distribution of containers across the nodes. The number over here, the 48 and 42 and all those signify the machine, the node nodes on which the containers are allocated. So it's essentially what you can see from here is like randomly placed. So now what we'll do is let's just go here and kill this app. I'm just killing that. I'll just uh, one sec. Hold on. Okay. Now let's go back. And uh, now what I'll do is like um, I would actually ask media to go and uh, affinitize all my containers to a particular. I mean, this is a general use case. You want all your containers to be in the same rack or node, like what Costas was presenting. So let's kind of affinitize all my uh, containers to a single load. And for this, I, one sec. Containers. And if you go here, in my application screen, yeah, my app, second application is started up. Okay, so first thing, a couple of things you need to go notice over here. First thing is that we've noticed that all the containers were actually allocated on the same node, uh, 41041. And on top you see that a couple of containers have not been allocated. So uh, in our setup, each node can only handle around, uh, can only uh, has uh, resources to start around 16 containers. So in our configuration of media right now, we have asked it to go and interpret a constraint as a hard constraint. What that means is if it cannot place a container uh, uh, that's satisfying the constraint, it'll just not place a constraint, which is the reason why you see so many containers over here in the pending state. It means it'll not place it. Uh, so here you see the affinity. So let's kill this, and what we can do is I can actually show affinity work being satisfied completely. So what we'll do is, let's start another application with the same affinity constraint, but with just around, let's say, eight containers. You go back to the application page. We got an app in which all our containers have been allocated on one node. Okay, so now there are cases where you probably need to go and, like, suppose you have an edge based application or uh, a memory system and you do not want interference with other containers, so you'd like to have all your containers being spread across your uh, cluster or your rack. So, for that, uh, uh, Costas talked about the anti affinity constraint, and I'll show you how we are actually um, doing this. See the app. Let's go go back to that page. Look at the new app. There you see all my containers have been allocated on totally different hosts. Uh, although one particular container, the master container, would for which we do not have any constraints specified, that will be co-located with one other node. Let's see. Yeah, 41 and 41. Okay. So now, uh, suppose you want something in between. You don't want full affinity, and you do not want full anti-affinity. You want to go, you know, restrict to something like uh, at most three containers per node. Uh, so that's also something media can support. Uh, let me just kill this. So here I say cardinality, and I want at most three containers uh, per node. And the 20 says I want the total number of containers to be 20. So I start this, 
and again I go back to my shell and go to the applications. There. So 21 containers have been placed and if you look at the other thing, you'll see that certain cases you have uh, single containers, certain places you have, let me just sort this out. You have no more than uh, 0 0.44. Four. There are three containers on 0 0.44. Four. There are two on 0 0.45. You will not have more than uh, three containers per node. So yeah, so uh, to recap, uh, we showed how media does uh, affinity constraints, anti-affinity anti constraints, as well as uh, cardinality-based constraints. So yeah, that's it. Uh, questions, guys? So actually, uh, depends. If, if they're hard, obviously you just fail. The, uh, you cannot do something, right? So in that case, you're talking more about soft constraints. So for example, it depends on the algorithm. So essentially, you have an optim ob objective function that tells you, you know, what is uh, the quality of the placement you have achieved. So you start relaxing some constraints. Your constraints might have even weight. So you can be like, I want to be placed on a node. Uh, if you cannot do it, I want to be placed on a rack, but it's more important on a node. So you have an objective function, and you try to achieve the, uh, the placement with the best. Uh, and so you start relaxing until, for example, if it's off, until you, know, you, you give the best placement. But for example, you know, in this case, like Arun showed, when you have 32 instances, and you try to run them on the same node, if you didn't have hard constraints, you would simply start putting them in, in a different node. So does this answer your question? How low does this scale? Because your, your example has eight nodes. Can you get to thousands of nodes? There's right. relatively little resources left. Uh -huh. I know a lot of constraint solvers tend to become very, very slow very, very quickly. Correct. Uh, so this is exactly the reason that, for example, you know, there are some schedulers, mostly research projects, that put all the, all the applications through the solver. So what we are doing instead is we are keeping the fair capacity scheduler without you know, the solver or anything. And just the, uh, just the long running applications are going through the ILP or, or any scheduler that you have. So in that case, just when something arrives, you only, care, uh, you only pay the cost for that specific one, but not for the, all the applications. So for example, I can show you some results we got actually from here, for example. Uh, here you can see we have, oh, it's good, yeah. So we have up to, this is the number of nodes, we have up to 5,000 nodes, for example. And this is the LRAs being 20% of the, of the cluster resources. And as they arrive, we place them. So as you can see, yes, for example, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, here. The node candidates, which is kind of a greedy solution, although it gives good results, in, even on a 5,000 node cluster, for its, um, its LRA that arrives, it does about like 200 milliseconds. The ILP, yes, I don't think, for example, we can use it for a 50,000 node cluster, but the node candidates with 200 milliseconds, it's pretty good. And it's really the fact that we are not putting all the, uh, all the applications through the solver. That's, that's really what is important here. That's, uh, that's average latency, but it's pretty much, yeah, more or less, the, there were not great variations. Of course, it depends also on your type of constraints, right? But for whatever we, reasonable scenario we tested, uh, it, was, uh, it was working pretty well. Because of that. So we actually work off trunk, but just for the sake of our demonstration, yeah. we, were, we actually used uh, uh, 272. So it should be available at 3.0. Yeah, correct. So mm -hmm. uh, the currently, I mean, the, in, the, in the Jira we have, in the latest Jira we have open, we are working on trunk. Mm -hmm. So it should be, uh, not sure about backporting into the branch too, but we have not worked on that yet. Correct. So, so the question was, whenever you want to schedule an LRA through the interceptor, whether you have to block the, the main scheduler, right? Uh, so actually, no, the way, the way we are doing it, think of it uh, that 
the, the LRA interceptor gets, uh, when, whenever it wants to play something, gets a snapshot of the cluster state, and it places based on that. At the same, while doing that, new applications, this is kind of a distributed scheduling problem, right? At the same time, other applications might have gone, and this state might have changed, right? So if the state has changed, I mean, most of the times, you know, unless the cluster is fully loaded, it must most probably be fine. Otherwise, you would go back to the LRA interceptor. And then, I mean, in the worst case, you either have to teach the schedulers to somehow relax the constraints. But in the, in the best case, I think, you know, the best thing you have to do is you go back to the LRA interceptor and uh, you can inform the user. And for example, you know, after some fails, you could try something else or relax the constraints. Or another thing we have been discussing, again, these are like on the design phase about what to do is, for example, use reservations. Like after like three times failing, you use reservations so that you can really say that, okay, for that I have my, my own, uh, you know, capacity to, to use. Yes. So that's another thing which we showed, right? The cardinality constraint thing, where you want something in between, where like we showed like at most three containers per node. You can actually have a constraint that says at most three per rack or to at least three per rack. So it, it is expressible using this language. So or another thing you can, so the, the question again was like how, like in on-premises it makes sense to do load balance, but when you're in a cloud environment, you might want to pack as much as possible. So another way to see it is, for example, tune your optimization function. Essentially, you have like different components in your optimization function, right? So one is the resource fragmentation, which is, uh, the other one is the load imbalance. The third one is what we call constraint fragmentation. So essentially what you could do is to put to zero the, for a cloud environment. The, the load imbalance component, and you give more, uh, more importance to the rest. And as long as you do, for example, resource fragmentation, you will pack everything as much as you can. Yes. So if, um, if an application started from the capacity scheduler, can, I, I mean, both are valid applications, and whatever happens in preemption, I mean, once they get scheduled, like even the LRA applications, you, you decide the placement on the interceptor, but then it's the capacity scheduler that does the actual uh, allocation, right? So they are equivalent, unless you are using different priorities or different queues. So in other words, whatever would happen in capacity scheduler with two normal applications will happen as well uh, with uh, LRAs versus non-LRAs. So to his point, uh, the LRA scheduler technique is not a scheduler per se, it, most, it actually, injects locality information to your resources, uh, to your resource requests kind of thing. That's how we've implemented it right now. So preemption all is kind of orthogonal to that. But it might be, you know, it's a good point, for example, to, to give higher priority to an yeah. LRA, et cetera. Yeah. Yes. yes. So how, how do you choose if it's a, like a struggler or, for example, it's really doing actual work? Uh, I mean, this is kind of like to the applications. I mean, we, in terms of Yarn, this is a container, right? So this is an allocation that it's more application specific. We will not do something for that. This is more like, for example, you know, you can apply techniques like struggler mitigation or you can see past history and uh, see that, oh, for example, this type of applications usually run in milliseconds, and right now it's running for five hours. So something must be going around. But from the Yarn's perspective, uh, you know, it's not Yarn's job, for example, to decide if something is a struggler. Yeah, it's more at the application level. Anything else? Yes. Have you thought anything about how game scheduling might fit in with this? Because like, like with the constraints you saw, for batch, if I, I limit it and only eight containers can run, okay, you'll still make progress. But in some situations in the storm, if you don't have all the nodes up, it, there, there is no point. 
que ya toda ley. So that, yes. Uh, so, so the question is whether you know we can couple the LRA scheduling with give okay. some gang scheduling guarantees, for example. So that uh, yeah, uh, you could specify some of the gang scheduling as mean cardinality, in a sense, right? Because you can say you know if you want, for example, you have ten containers and you want all of them to run, you could do something like you know within the cluster, I want at least ten like mean cardinality to be ten of them. So that could be a way. Um, Otherwise, I think also reservations there can play a role, you know, like to, to be able to, so one of the extensions we have thought of is to do, if you can, you know, like say through reservations, you can do gang scheduling, how you can support constraints and reservations at once, that could be another way. So I think at first approximations, we can do something just with the constraints for the gang scheduling, but for the full-fledged thing, probably we will need something more, but yeah, totally it's, uh, Correct. The number of containers that I get is 10, right? So, so all of this can be in an end of multiple constraints, or you can find what you what you request yeah. in the future. Right. And that, that was kind of my question. Is it looks like you have pretty well solved gang scheduling, even though there have been other requests for gang scheduling to happen. And I, I was just curious, have you thought through that? What, what other things would you want? Whether we can, yeah, we can use it already. You mean for gang yeah. scheduling? Can we put it, Right. Uh, I think so, but, but I mean, in a sense, I mean, we need to think this through because, yeah, you can do it as a hard constraint, for example. But then I think an extra thing would be to play with, to play with priorities or something so that you don't wait forever. Because, okay, you, you start scheduling and let's say you cannot place it for some reason. Like, what do you do? But I think, yeah, it, it can be used. It can be used. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Any other question? Okay. okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Kindly uh, provide some feedback on the uh, app if you guys can. Thank you.